Scripture for this morning is found in Hosea chapter 12, verse 4. He struggled with the angel and overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. He found him at Bethel and talked with him there. God's Achilles heel. You may wonder why I put God right next to Achilles heel, which is derived from Greek mythology. It's an idiom. In English, idioms are phrases that have meanings that you cannot deduce directly from the literal word. The Bible has impacted the English language profoundly with many idioms. Let's do a warm-up exercise before the sermon. I will share some idioms from the Bible, and you tell me if you can remember, if you can figure out what they mean. Salt of the earth. What does that mean? Anybody? Something precious, something reliable. Matthew 5.13. You are the salt of the earth. But if you have lost your favor, flavor, what good are you? Right? Here's another one. Paul says this. Thorn in my flesh. Anybody? What the thorn in my... Is it a real thorn? No. What? That's right. Something, a weakness or a physical flesh wound or something that's annoying. Something that's an inconvenience you can't get rid of. And that comes from 2 Corinthians 12, 7. In fact, Paul says, God granted me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan, so that I would not become too proud. Those of us who struggle with pride may want to ask for a blessing like that. Just keep it down a little bit, right? Ellen White used that. She said, if I become too proud as a prophet, may you strike me with sickness. And she was sick quite a lot of her ministry. So, consider these. Okay, third one. Let's try... Um, after my own heart. What does that mean? He's a man, he's a woman after my own heart. There you go. Aligned with God, right? Same, same emotions, same feelings. This is 1 Samuel 13, 14. As Samuel says, so it's not about obedience or disobedience. It's about being a man after God's own heart. That's what God is doing. Okay? How about this one? Ah, you probably don't know this one skin of my teeth. That's from the Bible. Skin of my teeth comes from the Bible. Does anyone know what that means? Just barely, narrowly. That's right. Just escape. comes from Job 19.20. He says, I am but, and here's another one, flesh and bones. We use that in English. I am but flesh and bones. I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. See that? It's from the Bible. All right, how is another one? Writing on the wall. You should know this from Crater Roll. Writing on the wall, what does that mean in English? That's right. There's eminent danger. It's become apparent. The time has come to face the consequences, right? Daniel 5, Belshazzar's feast. Rise and shine. We don't shine. So why do we tell somebody, rise and shine? What does it mean? Get up, come alive, you know, show who you are, right? comes from the Bible, Isaiah 61. Rise, shine, for the light has come upon you. The glory of the Lord rises upon you. Now, wouldn't that be a nice way to be woken up by your mom and dad? Whew! <laughs> All right, I'll give you um, one more. Pearls before swine. What does that mean? Pearls before swine. Anybody? It's when you throw something valuable in front of an uncultured audience that doesn't appreciate it. Okay? It comes from Matthew 6, 7. Don't throw your pearls before swine because they will trample them and then turn on you. That's right. These are all idioms. Achilles' heel is also an idiom. Achilles' heel comes from Greek mythology, there was a warrior named Achilles. His mother was Theratis, a goddess of the waters, and she heard a prophecy that he would die young. Well, what mother wouldn't do everything possible to save her child's life? So she took her infant son, went to the river Styx, dunked him in the water, because the waters were supposed to pre cause anything that they covered invincible. So she dunked him in the water, and Achilles went on to become a great warrior, survived many battles, until... A poisoned arrow hit him in the heel, and he soon died afterwards. Why? 
because that was what she was holding him by when she dunked him. The waters did not cover that one heel. And so Achilles' heel has come into the English language, meaning in an otherwise powerful person, a weakness, a hidden weakness, a place of vulnerability. And so I ask you, God is the greatest, most powerful being in the universe. Does he have an Achilles heel? Let's bow our heads in prayer as we open God's word. Dear Lord, we ask you to come upon us. Only the Holy Spirit makes the words of God come alive in our hearts. We ask you to come here and make these words come alive, to inspire us, to comfort us, to challenge us. Whatever the Holy Spirit needs to do, may it find room and a home in our hearts today. And may these stories come alive with life lessons on how to follow you ever more closely in Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 32. This is a family Sabbath. So I think it's worthwhile every couple of years to go back to some of the greatest stories in the Bible and reflect upon them again. Genesis 32 is today's topic, Jacob wrestling with the angel. Now you remember, Jacob was coming back home. After 20 years of being apart from Esau, they left when they were 40, so now they are how old? 40 plus 20 is? Thank you. You're in college. Good. So he comes back when he's 60, and he sends an announcement to his brother. He says, I have been sojourning with Laban until now. I have camels, donkeys, oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female servants, and I have sent to my Lord that I might find favor in your sight. But this litany of his achievements and his wealth meets nothing but an omen of silence on the other end. Instead, he hears Esau is coming to greet you with a welcoming committee of 400 armed men. Desperately, Jacob sends another token of his goodwill, four droves of animals, each tied up with a nice verbal bow. These are a present from your servant Jacob to his lord Esau. And behold, he is also right behind us. But Esau is still bearing down on him. Why should Esau trust Jacob's words? This is a man who would lie to his own blind father. Why should Esau accept any presents from Jacob? The last time he accepted a present, it was a bowl of red porridge, and you know what he lost in return. There is nothing Jacob can do to win Esau over, because Jacob was that younger brother always conniving, always deceiving, always hoodwinking everyone with his religious hypocrisy. Only the threat of brute force chased him away, and that's the language that Esau knows best. And so Esau comes with 400 armed men. But besides just revealing the strength of Esau, 400 armed men reveal the extent of his fear of Jacob. Meanwhile, on the other side of the river Jabbok, Jacob is wrestling with his past, with his demons. He knows that even though he's come a long ways, he's not the man he was before. Those traits of character are still deep in his soul. And so he prays in anguish. He prays for forgiveness, for protection, for acceptance, and suddenly a hand is laid upon him. He startles up in fear. He grabs that arm. He tries to throw the man down, but the man digs in. And all through the night, they wrestle, sweating, straining, panting, until the break of day. And all of a sudden, his man taps out. Now, in American wrestling, if a wrestler wants to signal submission and end the fight, they tap out. They tap the mat or they tap the body of their opponent. This man taps Jacob on the hip, and instantly his hip is incapacitated. Jacob crumbles to the floor in pain, and he grabs onto the only part of his anatomy that he can grab, and that is the ankle. Ironic, isn't it? Jacob, who came into this world hanging on to Esau's ankle, is now reduced at 60 years old to hanging on to the only ankle he should have been hanging on to all along, God's ankle. 
God pretends to tug away. Let me go, for day is dawning. And Jacob hangs on for life, and he pleads, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Then the omniscient one turns around, and an all-knowing God does something that an all-knowing God never needs to do. He asks a question. You know that. Every question God asks in the Bible is superfluous. He knows everything. Why does he ask a question ever? He turns to Jacob and he asks the most simple question of all. He says, what is your name? Why does he ask this? Because the last time Jacob was desperately seeking a blessing and was asked his identity was in the tent of his father Isaac. On that occasion, he was carrying a bowl of steaming goat meat. He was wrapped up in goat skins. He was wearing Esau's smelly clothes. And his father said, who are you, my son? And Jacob had answered in his deepest voice, I am Esau, your firstborn. You see, Jacob had always wanted to be Esau, the firstborn. Esau had become Jacob's idol. And that is why the consummate psychotherapist, God, brings him back to that point and asks him that question once again. What is your name? And finally, reduced in pain, totally helpless, knowing he was facing God, Jacob finally accepts his own identity and he answers truthfully, Jacob. And then and only then, God says, your, no, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, because you have wrestled with God and with man, and you have prevailed. Now, let me ask you, what kind of wrestling brought him this blessing? Was it the wrestling all through the hours of the night? No, it was not. All that physical wrestling only earned him a dislocated hip. That was it, and God was planning to leave him. No. What kind of wrestling earned him this blessing? It was the clinging to God's Achilles heel. It was the pleading that he would not let God go till he gets a blessing. Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets, in the chapter called The Night of Wrestling, page 179, he had fastened his trembling grasp in God's promises. And the heart of infinite love could not turn aside the sinner's plea. This is the secret of Israel. This is the kind of wrestling that captures God every time. Because God's Achilles heel, his heart of infinite love, had not turn aside from the sinner's earnest plea. Jacob had asked one blessing, but he got two. He not only got a new name, he also got a painful physical disability. Because as the sun rose over his head, he limped his way on front of his family caravan with his staff. And when he saw Esau in the distance coming before him, he started bowing. Oh, not the oriental bow like this, not the French kissing on both sides, no handshake. This is the Middle Eastern ancient bow, total prostration. So this man with his recently dislocated hip, which probably popped back into place, is now doing this. All the way down, painfully all the way up. One, two, all the way down. Painfully, all the way up. And as he does this seven times, I dare say, had Jacob bowed graciously and smoothly before Esau seven times, Esau from a distance would have thought, possibly, there he goes again, tricking me, trying to win my trust. It's a trap. But when he sees Esau, grimacing, in pain, and yet with a face full of peace and love. The nonverbals add up. And the image that Esau had of his younger brother as an invincible monster is shattered. 
and he sees before him only a fragile human being, vulnerable, his little brother in pain. And you know how the story ends. Esau breaks off in a run. He runs to Jacob. He embraces him. He falls on his neck. He kisses him, and they cry together. And Esau offers his 400 as a personal bodyguard. These two men finally fulfill God's vision of them at the very beginning. Let's wrap up the story. Go back to that beginning. Do you remember that prenatal prophecy? What was the very last line that we all know? The odor shall serve the... That's right. The Hebrew words, however, are rav and zoer. Rav and zoer literally just mean greater and lesser. And the reason why they translate it that way is when you use those two words, it's the context that determines how they're translated. So if I'm talking about money and I say Rav and Zoer, I mean to say expensive and cheap. If I'm talking about size, I say big and small. If I'm talking about chronology, age, then I would say older and younger. But who's to say that when this prophecy was given, that chronology is the only context? Could it possibly be more than one context? When Jacob is bowing seven times before Esau, he is proving that he is the greater because he has the heart to serve Esau. When Esau gives him 400 men as his bodyguard, Esau is proving he is willing to serve his brother. Therefore, he is the greater. You see, in modern culture, power is a linear differential. The weak serve the strong. And in Christianity, we try to reverse that and say, no, the strong serve the weak. But in God's economy, both can be great and serve each other. And both can be lesser and accept service. In God's mind, power is a circle, constantly reoccurring, not a linear path. So I would suggest that these translators of your Bible should have left it alone, made it literal. It should have just said, the greater will serve the lesser. And perhaps you will then see that the prenatal prophecy is not meant to be a thorn in the flesh that tore this family apart in rivalry, but God's injunction for true greatness that had they understood it spiritually, could have brought them together in harmony. Now let's take this story, because every Old Testament story points to the one grand event that is the linchpin of all world history, the cross. This weekend is Easter. So let's apply this to the cross, because they all do point there. Let me ask you, what is God's Achilles heel? It is the heart of infinite love. You say that. What is God's Achilles heel? It is the heart of? And how is this Achilles heel, God's soft spot, the source of his downfall? It brought him from heaven to earth to die on a cross. How did we wrestle with God? Oh, yes, we wrestled. We rejected him. We worked with Satan and his principalities to nail him to the cross. And here's the point. And how did God finish this fight and tap out? When he on the cross said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and died. And to all of us, we said, look, He's tapping out. The story is over. He's given up. He has succumbed to death. But spiritually, all of heaven rejoiced because he had vanquished the evil spirits. He had vanquished Satan. He had ripped away the shroud of lies and shown that the heart of evil is murder, murder of a loving God. And so the seed of the woman stamped and smashed the head of the serpent in that tapping out. Two completely different interpretations happen simultaneously on the cross. Is that not foretold through Jacob's wrestling? And then Jesus rests on the Sabbath day. And on Sunday morning, <coughs> who clung to his feet? Three women. Two women rushing back to tell the disciples that the tomb was empty. One woman who hung around the tomb. They both clung to Jesus' feet in relief and joy. And yet he said, don't detain me. I have to go. 
to claim my victor's crown and my throne. But before he left, he gave two blessings. One, that these women were to be the first evangelists of the resurrection. Two, to tell his brethren, you will see me again. Go to Galilee. I'm still with you. And so the consequences of this wonderful tapping out are, as Paul tells us in Romans 5.10, while we were yet enemies, God reconciled us to himself by the death on the cross. How much more then shall we be saved by his life? Because he is alive now and forevermore. How do you and I know we are saved? How do you and I know we are true Israelites? If you cling to God's Achilles heel, that infinite heart of love, and you say with Jacob, I will not let you go until you bless me. If you do that every day, every step of your life, God will hold on to you, and he will not let you go until he brings you home and gives you that white rock with your new name on it that nobody knows but him. And that is the victory that God has won for us. Let us celebrate Easter tomorrow with all of our hearts and never let go of God's Achilles heel.